Well, hello and good afternoon and good morning uh, to those of you who are joining us today uh, for this special Knox Live webinar event. We're so glad that you've joined us today uh, for what does Athens have to do with seminary? Uh, you're going to hear uh, directly from Dr. Josh Bruce in just a moment, but I first want to just introduce myself to you. My name is Matt Till, and I am the Director of Communications here at Knox Seminary. And just a couple of housekeeping things real quick before we get started, and we won't hopefully keep you too long if you're listening in on a uh, lunch break, perhaps, or taking some time out in your morning, depending upon where you're listening from or chiming in from. Uh, maybe even on the other side of the world right now, uh, where it might be evening time. Uh, we're just glad that you're here with us. Uh, first of all, uh, we want to let you know that uh, you're going to get a presentation from Dr. Bruce here in just a moment. It'll be about 20 minutes long or so. And during that time, we want to encourage you to send in your questions. Uh, we're going to leave as much time as we can to the end for to answer any questions that you might have, uh, whether just about the topic in which Dr. Bruce is going to share with us, um, or even something about Knox or the program that he's going to introduce you to as well. So there's a Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Uh, if you're listening on Zoom, that says Q&A for question and answer. Just go ahead and submit your questions there. We're going to moderate them. We'll take a look at them, and I will ask them uh, live right here with uh, Dr. Bruce. So we'll get to as many of them as you can. So as they come to you, feel free to populate that as well. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, also, too, the, as mentioned and as advertised, there's a free offer of additional course material that we are giving away to you for free just for attending today. We're going to give you the link to that at the end of our time together. Um, this is a full uh, course of just lectures that is, again, another course that you'd find as part of a uh, Christian and Classical Studies here at Knox. Uh, it's exclusively available at Knox. Um, it's from Dr. Bruce. 15 hours of lecture material to continue your learning. We want to equip you to be a confident leader in Christian ministry. And that's what we're about at Knox. And so we want to help do that with you. So we just thank you for your time today. And also, too, there's going to be a survey we'd love to hear from you about. And we'll talk more about that at the end of our time together today. So without further delay, I want to introduce you to Dr. Josh Bruce. Uh, Dr. Bruce is the Dean of Students here at Knox, as well as the Director of the Master of Arts in Christian and Classical Studies program. So Dr. Bruce, uh, say hello and why don't you take it away. Thank you, Matt. That was a great introduction. Really appreciate that. Um, it's a delight here to uh, uh, chat with you all a little bit about this unique little program here at Knox Seminary. Uh, the Master of Arts in Christian and Classical Studies. And to sort of pique everybody's interest, we came up with a title for this talk, uh, which was, What Does Athens Have to Do with Seminary? And I'm sure many of you are aware that there was a, a church father named Tertullian who very famously said, What Does Athens Have to Do with Jerusalem? So we used that uh, title for this talk and asked instead, What Does Athens Have to Do with Seminary? And when I was putting together my talk for you all, I was tempted to have the talk consist of just these words, a lot. <laughs> what does Athens have to do with seminary? And just say a lot, and then pass it back to Matt and, and conclude. But uh, apparently I have to take 20 minutes. So I'll uh, unpack that a little bit for us uh, here today and talk a little bit about uh, what Athens, what pagan beliefs, what old beliefs, what old books, what old ideas uh, have to do with a seminary context. and. Uh, to do that here, I thought it'd be helpful to use as a conversation partner somebody I am very familiar with and love very much, somebody named St. Augustine. Many of you will know St. Augustine, will love St. Augustine because you've read his confessions or you've read parts of City of God or things like that. But I thought Augustine might be a really interesting conversation for, partner for us here today. And in particular, uh, one little event towards the end of Augustine's life that most of us don't know very much about. Um, we don't know very much about it because we didn't know anything about it until just a few years ago. A few years ago, there was a scholar who found some new letters of St. Augustine. And in those letters, we found a story. The story is about a Roman politician who wrote to St. Augustine after St. Augustine was quite famous, after St. Augustine had become known for writing the Confessions and City of God and books like that. The Roman politician was interested in Christianity. So he wrote to St. Augustine this little letter enclosing his little boy's homework, sent it to Augustine and said, here's my child's homework. Would you look at it? 
and tell me if my boy shows any promise. Tell me if you think that one day my son might grow up and be important and famous like you. Augustine took the time to write back. And in these new letters of Augustine, we have his response. Augustine wrote back to this Roman politician and commented on the boy's work. He commented on the politician's son's homework. And he, when he does that, he calls him our little Greek. It's a very endearing way of talking about a little boy. It's like our little scholar. And Augustine says, your boy shows a great deal of promise. He's learning his Cicero. But Augustine says, remind your boy as he learns his Cicero of something that Cicero said. Cicero said that a good orator is actually a good man speaking well. And Augustine says, remind your boy that it's not just enough to learn skill and eloquence and excellence as a speaker and as a thinker. It's also important to be good. And here Augustine uses that as an opportunity to remind the Roman politician that there's only one man who was ever truly good, and it wasn't Cicero. Augustine tells the politician, remind your boy and remind yourself that Cicero doesn't have all the answers, that all the answers that we need as Christians come from Christ, the only truly good man speaking well. Now, that letter, I think, gives us a window into the perspective of this very important thinker in the Christian church, somebody named Augustine who thought through how we might retrieve these treasures in the Christian tradition, how we as Christians can go back and look at someone like Cicero and learn from Cicero, but then remember that Cicero doesn't have all the answers. Cicero didn't have it all figured out. In another of his works, um, St. Augustine talks about how Christian education should be done. He's got a book called On Christian Teaching, De Doctrina Christiana, On Christian Teaching. And he uses as a metaphor, a story that I'm sure you're all familiar with, the story of the plundering of the Egyptians. You remember the story? You remember when God's people leave the house of bondage in Israel and go into the promised land? You remember they, they take everything that isn't nailed down from the Egyptians and they take it into the promised land with them. Why? Because God has told them that if it's good, it's theirs. And St. Augustine, when he talks about what we as Christians do when we educate the young, when he talks about that, he uses that metaphor. And he says, we as Christians are plundering the Egyptians. If it's good, if it's true, if it's beautiful, it's ours as Christians. God has given that to us and we can take it. And so Augustine uses as an example, reading Plato. And he says, if you read Plato, and you find something that Plato had to say that was true, take it, make it yours. Plunder the Egyptians, take their knowledge, take that which is true and good and beautiful and make it yours and subject it to the rigors of scripture. Make sure that what Plato said is actually true. Make sure that it's consistent with the teachings of Christianity and if it is, it's ours. Here at Knox, in this little program, this Master of Arts in Christian and Classical Studies, we're doing just that. Here at Knox, we're reading old books. We're interacting with old ideas from the past, classic texts, classic ideas, classic debates, philosophical debates, scientific debates, debates within uh, the field of literature over what's true and good and beautiful. And as we do that, we're doing something that's very consistent with what Augustine told us to do to plunder the Egyptians, to take that which is good and true and beautiful and make it ours. Now, it's important to say that for Augustine and for us here at Knox and for Christians through the ages who have been doing that, for all of you who are doing that in your professions, whether you're a teacher or a homeschool parent or leading a homeschool co-op or a pastor, whatever profession you're in, you know that you're not just taking these things wholesale. You're not just taking them uncritically. If you're teaching Plato, if you're teaching an old text, if you're teaching an old idea, you don't do it uncritically. You subject it to the teachings of Christianity and you make sure it's consistent with that. But if it's true, you know it's ours. And we as Christians can lay claim to it and hold it dear and make it our own. Now, we're doing that in a way that is very consistent with what Augustine taught, but here at Knox, we're in the Reformed tradition. And this little seminary, Knox Seminary, has a long tradition of teachings which are consistent with the Protestant Reformation. 
one of the things that makes this program so unique is that we're doing something that 500 years ago, the reformers were calling their people to do. 500 years ago, one of the rallying cries of the Protestant Reformation was ad fontes, back to the sources. The reformers were calling on their people to go back to the old text, to go back to scripture, to go back to the church fathers, and to test the teachings of the church in their day against those old works. Is the practice of penance, is the practice of the belief in purgatory, are those things actually consistent with the old ideas from scripture and from the church fathers? And the reformers, as you know, ultimately said no. But the rallying cry of the Reformation was to go back to the sources. That's exactly what we do here at Knox when we read these old books and when we engage in these old debates. We are plundering the Egyptians, as Augustine told us to, and we are going back to the sources, as our Protestant forefathers told us to do. Lastly, just in terms of our philosophy of what we're doing here, what we are doing is very consistent with one of the most important thinkers in the 20th century, somebody who's been very influential to me, and I suspect for many of you, he's had a big impact on you, somebody named C.S. Lewis, who wrote an introduction to a little book called On the Incarnation. If you haven't read his introduction to this book, I highly commend it to you. Uh, it's published online. It's available for free under the title On the Reading of Old Books. And in this introduction, C.S. Lewis makes the case for exactly what we're doing here at Knox in this little program. C.S. Lewis makes the case for going back to the old texts, the old books. And he does it somewhat sarcastically in a number of ways. And if you've read this introduction, you know this, that C.S. Lewis comments on the fact that Plato is very easy to read. What's hard to read, he says, are commentaries on Plato. Plato is understandable. What's hard to understand are people trying to help you understand him. And so he talks about that and he, he gives us an example. This is one of my favorite examples from Lewis. He says that there is a lady in his congregation who's reading the Gospel of John so she can try to understand her bishop's commentary on it. The Gospel of John is understandable, but her bishop isn't, okay? So C.S. Lewis makes this argument for going back and reading the old books, and he begs people to do exactly what we're doing here in this program at Knox, to go back to the text, to encounter the text for the first time, and if you've already encountered them, to re-encounter them for the second, third, and fourth time. Why? Because they're good. Because they're actually, they've actually stood the test of time because they're understandable. C.S. Lewis says it this way. This is one of my favorite quotes from this introduction. He says, it has always been one of my main endeavors as a teacher to persuade the young that firsthand knowledge is not only more worth acquiring than secondhand knowledge, but is usually more, much easier and more delightful to acquire. Now, those of you who are teachers, if you're leading a homeschool co-op or you're a homeschool parent or you're teaching in a Christian or a classical school, or you're a pastor who's incorporating these things into your sermons, you know that. You know that the, the joy of your students on encountering one of these texts is so incredible and it's infectious. It infects everybody around them. Say, wow, this person living 1,800 years ago, 2,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago felt that? I feel that too now. <laughs> They encountered that challenge. Well, I feel that too. I encounter that too. The joy of encountering these old texts for the first time, for the second time, for the third time, is realizing that we share a common humanity. We share something in common with Aeneas of old or Hector of old or any of these, these old characters or figures written about in these old texts. One of the things that C.S. Lewis talks about in his introduction that I think is really interesting and helpful for us, especially in a seminary context, is C.S. Lewis talks about the fact that books from ages ago and ideas and debates from ages ago all had their blind spots. If you're reading a text and it's a thousand years old, there are blind spots that people living a thousand years ago had. C.S. Lewis says, that's true. But here's the thing, you and I living in our own present day have our own blind spots. We have things that we don't see. By definition, they're blind spots. We can't see them, right? C.S. Lewis says the reason to go back into the ages and read these ancient texts and read these ancient debates for yourself is because you'll see their blind spots, and that's good. It's good to notice those, but they'll see some of yours. They'll actually correct some of the things you take for granted because everybody in your own day takes it for granted too. 
And so what we do here at Knox is we go back and we appropriate these things. We read ancient texts. We study ancient ideas. Many of them come from outside of the realm of Christianity. We read pagan texts. We read ancient texts before Christ. We read texts and study debates that have taken place after Christ on the part of people who weren't Christians. We do it with the mentality of somebody like Augustine, that we are plundering the Egyptians. We are taking what is good and true and beautiful from the past, and we're calling it our own. We're making it our own, not uncritically, certainly not just accepting everything that was said because it's old, but instead as Christians, if it's true, we know God gave it to us for our use, our benefit, and our enjoyment. And all those of you who are already doing this know that. If you are teaching these things, if you are sharing these things with others, which I suspect many of you already are, you know that that's true. Now, what's cool and unique about this program is very, very few seminaries have caught on to this. <laughs> We're one of the only seminaries in the world that actually has a classical great books program like this one. And so what you get here at Knox is something that's pretty unique. And Knox is here to give you resources, to give you information. If you're interested in taking classes with us, you're welcome to do that. But Knox is very, very unique in what we do. And so I'd like to share with you just in a couple minutes here, a little bit about what we do here at Knox, here in this particular program. So Matt, if you have it, if you wanna share on the screen here, um, a little bit of an outline in terms of what the MACCS program looks like. In essence, and it looks like it's taken a minute to, to share and that's totally fine, but in essence, what the, the MACCS program looks like is you will take, if you take the program, eight core classes. And those eight core classes are you are plundering the Egyptians. They are your opportunity to go back into the past and read ancient texts and study ancient debates. You'll see there listed for you those eight core classes with their course numbers. The first of those eight classes all have to do with literature. They're genre-based classes. So in those classes, you'll study epic literature, tragic literature, comic literature, and lyric literature. If you know Aristotle and um, uh, his writings on literature, you'll know that he basically divided up all of classic literature into those four main categories. They're not comprehensive of all categories of literature, but they're big ones. And so in those four classes, you'll actually take the time to go back and read epics like the Iliad, like the Aeneid, like Moby Dick, and so on. And in each of those courses, epic, tragic, comic, and lyric literature, you get an opportunity to go back and engage at a very deep level with these ancient texts. I keep using the word critical because it's important. You don't do it unthinkingly. You're asked to engage with these texts from a Christian perspective. You're asked to understand these texts and interact with these texts in a way that actually sees Christ as the final answer to all of the yearnings and longings of people through um, history. So we don't go back to the Iliad to learn how to be like Hector, full stop. <laughs> But we go back and we read the Iliad and we see things in Hector that remind us of Jesus, that point us to Jesus, that show us that Jesus is the ultimate fulfillment of the longings of people from even many, many ages ago. Now, in addition to those four um, literature-based courses, we have ideas and practices-based courses that you're required to take if you join the MACCS program. Those classes are listed for you there, but they're the history of science, philosophical foundations, pedagogical practices, and a class we're calling classic arts and culture. Those classes give you a sense for what's going on around classic texts, the philosophical debates that have happened through the ages, scientific debates and discoveries and developments that have been significant through the years, um, classical uh, arts and culture, the sorts of things that are taking place um, culturally and in society while these different texts are being, being written and being um, 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 spread through the world. And then finally, you'll actually take a class where you study the philosophy of education itself. How do you as a Christian educator do a better job of sharing these things with others in a classroom setting or in a church setting or in a, you know, in a Sunday school class or in a pulpit, those sorts of settings? How do you do a good job of actually sharing these things with others? In addition to these eight core classes, you'll take um, church history one and church history two to give you a perspective on developments in the Christian church through the ages. 
The first of those church history classes basically goes from the time of Christ up to the time of the Protestant Reformation. The second of those classes goes from the Protestant Reformation to the present. I want to comment quickly here on our electives. You'll see there that as part of the, the uh, Master of Arts in Christian and Classical Studies program, you get 15 elective hours. One of the things that's really cool about that is you get to craft for yourself what your electives look like. If you have a real interest in New Testament, you get to take classes on the New Testament and its context. If you have an interest in systematic theology, we give you the flexibility to take a number of systematics courses. Because we are a seminary, you get the privilege of taking these courses with people who specialize in those areas. If you take New Testament courses here, you'll take one of my friends who's got the office right behind me, Dr. Sam Lamerson, wonderful scholar of the New Testament, and so on. You'll get to take classes with people who actually specialize in those areas. That's one of the uniquely cool things about the program here at Knox and the fact that we're in a Protestant seminary context. Lastly, just in terms of how we do this in the program, you'll notice that there's a capstone project. That is a, a thesis project where at the end of your degree program, you tie it all together. You get the opportunity and you're encouraged to take everything that you've learned and put it all together. So that's kind of what it looks like here in the program uh, at Knox. So we've talked a little bit about the philosophy of why we do this in a seminary. And then we've talked a little bit about how we do it practically, what it looks like on the ground. I just wanna say in, in terms of a conclusion to all this, that I know that many of you are already doing this. Many of you are working in all sorts of fields, not just as pastors, but as teachers, as homeschool parents, as homeschool co-op leaders. You are, you are already doing these things. One of the beauties of what we do here at Knox is we come to you. We don't pull you out of your field. We don't pull you out of your context and bring you here. We come alongside you. And so our goal, whether you're coming here to take the master's degree, whether you're coming here to take one of our certificate programs, the certificate in the MACCS program or otherwise, our goal is to come to you and equip you to do what you're already doing and to give you a fully accredited degree or a fully accredited certificate, or in many cases, just continuing education that will keep you um, sharp, that will equip you, that will encourage you, and will allow you to do these things. Most of you already know everything that I've said. You're already doing this, I'm guessing. But the, the cool thing about what we're doing here at Knox is that we can come to you with this fully accredited, fully online uh, type of education and come alongside you encourage you and equip you. And so I'm here uh, to answer questions for you. I know Matt is also a great resource for you. So I'm going to pass it off here at this point to Matt. Um, but uh, thank you for, for letting me share a little bit about why I love this program here. Josh, thanks so much for your time and just your uh, taking time out of your day uh, with all of us today. This is wonderful. And I think I've been, so even a comment come in, just this idea of plundering the Egyptians and uh, you know, it's ours, right? Uh, if it's God's truth, then it must belong to us. And just kind of going back even, it's just it's such a, I think an exciting revelation for many. Um, I, by the way, for those of you who are, who are involved on uh, just listening in and, and consuming, thank you so much. I'm seeing questions come in, keep them coming. We're going to get to them in just a minute and uh, we'll get them over to, uh, to Dr. Bruce here in just a second. Uh, Josh, I wanted to actually just kind of something I was thinking of that maybe you could, as a, as a way to start here, is, you know, we talk about this idea of looking at the old books, the classic books, even some of the pagan writers. Yep. Talk about Knox's commitment to a fun, fundamental uh, reformational truth of sola scriptura. And how does this encounter as we look at the great books and, and kind of plundering the Egyptians, if you will? Sure. I actually just talked about this because in part of my role here is to teach church history as well. And so uh, in one of the lectures that was just recorded on this notion of sola scriptura, I talked about this. So I, Matt and I didn't collaborate on this, but it's great timing that you asked that. Um, one of the things that we as Protestants can get wrong is we take the rallying cry of the, the reformers, sola scriptura, scr scripture alone as the final authority of all matters of faith and practice. And we say, well, that means that the only thing we as Christians need to ever look at is our Bible, <laughs> and that's a mistake. So here at Knox, what we, what we fully affirm is the traditional Reformed perspective on Scripture, which is that Scripture stands as the final authority for all matters of faith and practice. On a yearly basis, I take a pledge as a professor here that I believe that. 
And so if I have a question and scripture speaks to it, scripture is the final authority, not tradition, not pagan works, not other works, not even good Christian works. Scripture is the final authority. But one of the things that some of us have done, and I doubt that anybody attending here has done this, but in the broad Protestant tradition, one of the mistakes that we've made is, said because, is saying because scripture is the final authority, it's the Supreme Court, if you will, on all matters of faith and practice, we don't need to read anything else. And the fact of the matter is, scripture itself doesn't do that. Paul is well-versed in the teachings of people who were pagans. He, when, when you watch him on Mars Hill, clearly is citing people uh, outside of his scriptural tradition. So Paul knew that there was truth to be found in other areas. And if it's consistent with scripture, then it's ours. Um, so what we are doing here at Knox in a re reformational setting is being very faithful to the idea that scripture stands alone as the final authority but also being faithful to the example of people like Paul, which is that we can learn from other books. If Plato said something that's true, that's mine. Um, so I don't know if that, that fully answers what you're saying, but does that, does that make sense? Yeah, that's, that's wonderful. And I think it's helpful too, as, as we all come from different you know, places uh, across the Protestant uh, Reformation, if you will, uh, depending on where we're all coming from, I'm sure that's a question that people are starting to ask or thinking about themselves as we study these things. Uh, what an exciting program uh, as well, uh, Josh. All right, we've got some questions coming in. I want to feed a few of them to you. Uh, one actually came in from Martin, and I think this is great. And forgive me, I think we've done something like this before, but he's asking, does Knox offer a European teaching tour to lands and places that fostered the old writings, uh, such as Greece, Italy, the Holy Land? Um, is that something we offer? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the answer is yes. As of next year, I will lead that tour and Martin is going to pay for it. So <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I, I believe there have been those sorts of collaborations in the past that we don't, as far as I'm aware, we don't do that right now, but we should. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Let's put that into the idea hat. All right. There you go. Great. Uh, Eric, thanks so much. He's a graduate of the MACC program uh, from a few years ago. He says he highly recommends the program. Thanks so much, Eric, for, for your uh, just your contribution here. Uh, we've got a question here about, do we have any free online courses to enhance biblical knowledge and scripture? Yes, actually, you're going to get access to one today. It's not a full course, it's, uh, but it is actually the full course lectures. Um, and we've been also, we've been giving some others away too on our website. If you go to knoxseminary.edu, uh, right now we have a current course or at least a uh, video content on um, discipleship from Dr. Pete Ellison. Um, so we've been slowly kind of releasing some of that material as we can to equip you. Um, but all of our graduate and all of our postgraduate programs are fully online now. So uh, this program, Josh, is that correct? You could take this program completely online from the That's comfort correct. of your home or office? That's correct. And it's something I mentioned, but I should just highlight this, that we have um, both a full, uh, fully accredited master's program that's 48 credits, but we also have a certificate program that's 18 credits. It's also fully accredited, also fully online. So you can take the entirety of either the master's program or the certificate program entirely online without coming here uh, on campus. I should mention that of late here at Knox, and this has partly been inspired because by the, the COVID situation, but we are offering more and more uh, classes that are being taught live residentially to students around the world. So students are able to pipe in over Zoom or, or technology like that. Um, and, and be part of the class as it's being taught here on the Knox campus in South Florida, but students are increasingly uh, joining us for those classes from Denver, Colorado, or from Seattle, Washington, and places like that. So I should just mention that, but yes, it's fully online and fully accredited. And just to be clear too, the online schedule is uh, a bit synchronous as well. So there's actually a start date um, and an end date. Uh, you're a part of a course or like a cohort, if you will, with other class members. Um, so it's not truly uh, asynchronous where it's, you do it on your own time, correct? That's right. And we've, we've increasingly, and we've gotten tremendous feedback from students, so we're going to keep this up. But we've increasingly included things like Zoom sessions uh, during the course of an eight-week online term where you'll get a chance not just to, to interact with the professor facilitating the course online, but also with your fellow students. And that gives you some of that face-to-face -face experience that students sometimes miss um, when they're, they're taking online classes. 
Josh, we've got a couple of questions here, one from Gabriel, but also from Catherine, uh, both asking about our classes in the ancient languages and biblical languages, such as Greek, Hebrew, and Latin. Can you speak to those? We have a number of classes in both Greek and Hebrew. Uh, my first year here as a professor, I taught uh, biblical Greek, um, but we have a number of classes in biblical Greek and Hebrew. All of those classes are available online. Um, we are looking at uh, adding a, a, a Latin course or two as well that would be targeted specifically towards students in this particular program. So uh, stay tuned for that in terms of Latin, because I would like to see that in the not so distant future as part of this program, um, at least as an elective. But we do have currently uh, biblical Greek and biblical he uh, Hebrew that are offered uh, online to our students here. Josh, here's another question. We got actually got two of them um, that came in. What kind of professions do people who get this degree in masters of, you know, classical and Christian, like what Christian and classical studies, what professions do they tend to go on to? That's a terrific question. So a bunch of different professions, but the main ones would be working as a headmaster or an administrator at a Christian or a classical school, um, teaching in a Christian or classical school, Many people teach in homeschool co-ops or informal educational settings like that. And we have quite a few folks who are homeschool parents who actually want to just go on and continue homeschooling their kids, but with this, um, with this uh, degree to sort of equip them further for doing that. We also have then a variety of people who go on as pastors, um, who are doctors and lawyers and people in other professions as well. But the majority of the folks that are graduating from this program are either going to teach in a classical or Christian context or work in one of those contexts, but certainly not all. So we have a lot of folks that also use it to equip them. Um, we've got, you know, people that, that uh, you know, want to practice in, in law and just have a better sense for Plato while they're doing it. And that's totally fine. I used to be a trial attorney myself before I came here. And, um, you know, this is the kind of stuff that would equip you well to do just about any profession. But the teaching professions are the, the predominant um, uh, profession that people go into. I recently had a conversation with one of our alumni who uh, serves as a pastor. And uh, this individual was just speaking so highly of this particular degree program mm -hmm. that um, just felt like that this was actually supplemental to mm -hmm. his already learning. So he had, I think, already received a master of arts in biblical theology from another uh, institution or a master's of divinity, but he stumbled upon this particular program and he was using it as supplemental to his teaching ministry, to his preaching ministry, um, and spoke very, very highly of it um, in a way that it felt like it provided uh, additional resources and education um, for him to be able to lead a congregation and to enrich his sermons and to enrich uh, his ministry. So uh, just again, like, I just feel like, like this is a really fascinating, uh, different type of approach that isn't as common uh, as you already said, um, Josh, that this isn't, a, this is pretty unique seminary degree, but we're finding that those who take it um, are really enriched by it greatly. And it, it really does enrich your, your speaking and your preaching in many ways. You know, if you're preaching on a theme of blindness in the New Testament and you've read classical texts that talk about blindness and the motif of blindness and what it means, you know, you have analogies and examples and references that you can make in the context of teaching or preaching on that. It's really going to enrich people's experience of that listening to you. Um, they're going to feel that you not only know the text of scripture, but you know some of its context as well. Josh, can you also, we've got a question here about are the faculty, our online faculty, are they the same as our residential faculty? Um, what changes or have shifts have been made there? And maybe you could speak to that. Yeah, the, the, the short answer is increasingly yes. So increasingly the direction of this program in Knox more generally is to have uh, professors who have taught the class residentially then facilitated online. So for students who come into the MACCS and take for instance, the classic epic literature class that was taught by me residentially, they'll then have me facilitating the class for them online. And you made reference, uh, Matt, I think to the way that our online classes run, but I'll just say our online classes typically are eight week courses 
where each particular week of the course, you have a predictable sort of assignment. The first week you do the same sort of thing. The second week you do the same sort of thing in pretty much all the classes. And I will tell you as somebody who I went through this program myself. I actually left the practice of law to come here to join this program. So even before I led it, I was here as a student. That is a development here that has been really, really helpful for our students. So if you're working full time as a teacher and taking an online class to know, OK, I'm in the third week of the class. I've taken a class before and I know that during the third week we do this sort of thing. That is really, really helpful. So we've gotten a lot of very good feedback from our students just on the predictability of the assignments and things like that in these eight week courses. Josh, we've got another question here just, um, and maybe I can even speak to this. Uh, in terms of payment, are there options to pay in installments and what do our scholarship programs look like? Great question, always a common one. Um, Derek, who works in our admissions office, is the pro on this, and so I would refer you to him. But what I would simply say is like, yes, we have payment installations available um, on a monthly basis and some other kind of programs available too. Um, our scholarship program is a church partnership program, which is uh, really uh, an exciting program that if you are a part of a member of a church or actively in a, some sort of other type of ministry that is able to partner with you in your educational goals to help see you uh, continue in your education, what we do is we divide up the payments by in, into threes. So uh, your church will help pay for a third. Uh, you pay for a third and Knox through our donors covers the remaining third. And that is uh, the way that a lot of our seminary students are able to make a seminary affordable and keep you out of debt while continuing your education as well. I'm going to put into the chat right now, actually, a link to learn more about that program. And so you can click on that and you can find out more. Plus, also on our website at knoxseminary.edu, you'll be able to uh, figure out, be able to see what our payment programs look like as well, too. Let me just add while you're doing that, Matt, as yeah. well. Um, we have a number of students in the program right now who are teaching or working in Christian or classical school contexts, and their school has taken advantage of that uh, pastoral partnership uh, program. So, um, you know, the, the, um, the program you're posting the link for is specific to churches, but there are a number of schools that have taken advantage of that too, who've partnered with us uh, in sending teachers of theirs or administrators of theirs to us and taking advantage of that, that partnership program. So I just want to add that, that for folks who are working in a Christian or classical school context, you may want to talk to your school and see if they'd be interested in doing the same sort of thing that we do with churches. Josh, I'm glad you mentioned that. And speaking of uh, schools and ed uh, educational institutions, we actually have a question here about can the are these classes um, able to be used as continuing educational units for those who are maybe serving in those kind of environments? That is a terrific question. I'm so glad somebody asked that. The, the, the short answer is yes. In almost every case, a class that you take here at Knox should count for your continuing education um, because we are fully accredited. So in the vast majority of cases, you will be able to take a class here and have that count towards your continuing education because the classes are all fully accredited. All right, um, thank you, Josh. Uh, just a couple of other uh, questions here. We're getting down closer to the end of our time. Um, and so just wanted to make sure that if you've got more questions, please feel free to continue to, to put, uh, go ahead and put them in. Uh, we've got about five more minutes left in which we'll take your questions. Uh, and thanks again, just uh, Josh, just for your time today, uh, for all of us. And then uh, we're going to go ahead and get to uh, just the uh, the free course lecture offer in just a few minutes. We'll just get through these uh, remaining questions here. Um, we, we've got one here about does Knox help provide with any sort of academic writing? Is there do we have like a writing center, perhaps somebody who might be uh, maybe English as a second language or so, something of that sort? Uh, what kind of support do we do for students in that? We have support, it typically comes from the professors, and then we have some informal venues that we've used in the past in terms of having folks help um, with writing, but it's an interesting idea and suggestion, something we could pay, maybe look at down the road. That That's the sort of question that's probably above my pay grade, though. <laughs> <laughs> we'll ask Dr. Manor about that one. There you go. All right, or Dr. Sansbury. Uh, there's a question here about the Socratic. Uh, are there Socratic discussions done? How do we do that um, it, through the online format? Um, so you will see it happening in the, the live classroom. So 
just about every class that you take is going to be filmed at a time when it's live. So you will see those sorts of Socratic discussions taking place. Uh, I'd like to say that I fill in for Socrates well, but I'm afraid that that isn't always the case. But I do like the Socratic method. Um, I was a trial attorney before becoming a professor here. And so I appreciate the Socratic method. Uh, that was the method that was employed in law school for most of my classes. So I have a great appreciation for that. So you'll see it taking place when you watch the lectures at key moments. Um, but we also have something called a community forum where I as the course facilitator or others who are facilitating a course will inspire discussion amongst uh, your, yourselves as students where I will ask a question like, is Aquinas just Aristotle baptized? You know, is Aquinas nothing other than Aristotle wrapped in a Christian flag? And those sorts of questions are often in, uh, meant to inspire debate and discussion. And we see some of those debates and discussions taking place in many of these classes. Um, so yes, the Socratic method is employed at key moments, both in the live classroom and then through things like um, the community forum that we have as part of our, our, our online classes. Uh, Josh, a couple more questions. Um, is there a, uh, do we offer, does Knox offer a, like a, a refresher on Greek perhaps? Um, is there just a one-off course that somebody could take just to kind of refresh their Greek or Hebrew even? That would, I, I would suggest that, that, that whoever's asking that question probably will, would want to reach out to Dr. Sam Lamerson here, who's in charge of our languages, but in particular Greek. I don't know that off the top of my head. Um, I suspect that the refresher would be simply taking the first uh, course, um, but that's, a, that's probably a better question for Dr. Dr. Sam Lamerson, who's our, our biblical studies professor. Great. Um, and then also Diana, uh, Diana's asking, is there an option? Can somebody audit one of these courses online, online, not necessarily residential? Do we know, do you have an answer for that? That's a question for our registrar. I'm perfectly fine with that, but that that's probably a better question for our, our registrar or perhaps our admissions director, Derek. Okay. Um, Diana, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you actually, and I'm just going to put it right here in the chat. Um, it, for questions like that, uh, you're going to email admissions at knoxseminary.edu, and that would be a great question uh, for Derek, who would actually read your email. So I just went ahead and threw that into the chat there, but that is a fantastic question to see what the availability and, the, and, and uh, what that might look like for you. Uh, last question is this, uh, what are maybe, do you have a top three or two or three ancient Christian literatures that are particular uh, titles that you would recommend, Josh? Uh, books in the tradition, the, the Christian tradition, or just broadly the great books tradition? I, it looks like uh, broadly the great books. Okay. Uh, I would tell you, first of all, just picking three is like getting rid of one of my kids. So it's kind of hard to, <laughs> to limit it to three, but um, three that you will read in this program that I think will be profoundly important to you would be the Iliad by Homer. We read that in the classic epic literature uh, course. So the Iliad by Homer, um, the Aeneid, of uh, Virgil. Um, both of those works are really, really important, very important for sort of shaping the Western imagination. And then the third I would say is the Divine Comedy of Dante. Um, Dante's Divine Comedy, and in particular his Inferno, is a, a work that we read in the program. We read it in the classic comic literature program. And um, I've had a lot of students circle back to me and, and talk about just how impactful that work was for them in terms of shaping their imagination, especially shaping their Christian imagination. So anyway, it's hard to pick only three though. I, we'd be here another hour and a half if I rattled off all the ones I want to say. I love it. We'll do another uh, episode or uh, we'll do there another event where we just discuss your favorites. How does that sound? <laughs> awesome. Well, Josh, thanks so much for your time. And uh, just to all of our, uh, just to our guests, thank you for your time today as well. Um, what we want to do is uh, here at Knox Seminary is we are about continuing to equip you as a confident leader in ministry. So whatever your profession may be, what, uh, even if you are, are working in a other vocational job, but you are somebody who's, who wants to be further equipped as a confident leader, somebody who knows what they know to believe and, uh, pursue and is on this pursuit uh, for knowledge and hunger and truth, uh, Knox Seminary is here for you. And so this is why we want to continue to provide free resources such as, and events such as this, um, as well as be able to give you additional things that we do uh, internally here for our students and be able to kind of push some of that out to you as much as we can. Uh, and that is within reason. So again, we're here for you to walk alongside of you and to help you in your educational goals. 
Um, if you would please, as part of that, is we have a post-event survey. It should pop up in your browser when you go ahead and close out this Zoom session in a few minutes. Uh, it should already be there. If not, I went ahead and put a link into the group chat. Would you please just take two minutes just to complete that for us? Your feedback is greatly valuable to us as we learn to continue to provide such these resources like this more. We'd love to hear back from you about that. And then secondly, uh, we want to be able to give you this free access to lectures on classic lyric literature uh, by Dr. Bruce. And uh, you'll see it here that there's a link. I'm going to get that to you right here in the chat in just a moment. Um, but this is a course. And maybe, Josh, could you just speak a little bit about this course and what people uh, might be getting and can expect to receive uh, through uh, these lectures that we're giving away? Yeah, of course. Glad to. Um, this was one of my favorite of the literature-based courses. We had a really great a group of students when this was originally taught and filmed. And basically what it is, is a survey of the genre of literature that we call lyric. Um, there are a number of different names for it. Uh, Aristotle called it dithyrambic, um, but it's basically the poetic genre of literature, the sort of elegiac, uh, timeless sort of literature. And so we read a number of poems, a number of works that we consider to be lyric. And so uh, the students in the class were reading uh, Wendell Berry, and uh, um, Pindar and uh, authors like that who have written classic works of lyric literature. So if you love poetry, if you're interested in the poetic genre of literature, if you maybe are memorizing poems, I've got two boys who have a number of poems memorized because I tell them a poem every night when they go to bed. Uh, if you're one of those people, this is gonna be a really uh, enjoyable class to you. Um, so you'll get to interact with some of the great uh, works of lyric literature through the ages. Well, Josh, thanks again just for your time. And uh, if, friends, that's, that is our gift to you uh, from Knox. Uh, feel free to, to go ahead and uh, use that link and just get, provide your name and email address. And immediately you'll get an email from us with access to the, uh, uh, the 15 hours of video content uh, from Dr. Bruce. That is an actual course that, that you can take for credit. Um, with Knox. And so we would encourage you as well, if you're, if this is something you're interested in and thinking about, man, maybe I want to try out a course or just uh, maybe just try, you know, one opportunity uh, of that sort. Uh, or maybe you're just thinking about, I just kind of want to see if my eligibility is feel free to reach out to us. You can reach out to me directly. I'll get you in touch with the right individuals. Um, if you have any particular questions about uh, what we're doing here at Knox, um, our admissions department is ready for you uh, to be able to, uh, so you can receive any sort of information you'd like, or these additional questions that might be lingering uh, out there, or just even get an application started. You can do that right away online at our website at knoxseminary.edu. Well, so for Josh and myself, thank you so much just for your time today. We're grateful that you took the time out of your day to join us. We hope that this was a benefit and a blessing to you. And please uh, be sure to fill out that, uh, that survey for us as we would value your feedback. Uh, on behalf of Josh and the seminary, thank you again. And hopefully we'll have a chance to talk again sometime soon. Goodbye, everyone.